I mean, people pine for love, they live for love, they kill for love, and they die for love. About 36% of singles in America today have had sex with somebody before the first date. They're moving from the one I stand into the friends with benefits, and I just think they're checking the person out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you actually learn a lot between the sheets. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Open Relationships, Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller. I'm joined by my colleagues, Jonas Koffler, and our amazing producer, Ryan Atkins. We have an incredible show teed up for you today, including the one and only, our amazing guest, Dr. Helen Fisher. Woo! A lot more on her. There's a ton more on her. Stay tuned for that. But let me just, since we're still a little early on in, in the life of this show, let me talk to you a little bit about what we're doing here at Open Relationships. Our society's inability to embrace differing perspectives is tearing us apart. It is tearing apart families. It's tearing apart friendships. It's tearing apart our country and causing us to be increasingly alienated from one another. I know you guys have heard it before, but I'm going to say it again. The hurt, heartache, and loneliness we are collectively experiencing are making us sick and profoundly unhappy. While most of us wish the challenging people in our lives could just be more like us or just go away, we know that relationships offer a profoundly important forge for our own transformation. So mastering how to be open to other is how we free ourselves, whether it's a squabble with a friend, a painful disagreement with your dad, a constant battle with your spouse or, or son or whoever it is, you're learning to become genuinely open and not waiting for the other person to go first who's guilty of that. You're learning to be open is how you transform in your life. Relationships are not a spectator sport, folks. It is time for us all to make contact. So let's get started. Welcome to Open Relationships. On that note, um, perfect time to transition. We have our guests here in the lobby, if we Ellen would like to. Ellen Fisher in the waiting room. All right, let's welcome an amazing, amazing superstar, one of my all-time faves guest, the one and only Dr. Helen Fisher. Whew, there's a lot to say here about Helen. Uh, uh, Helen Fisher, Dr. Helen Fisher, is a biological anthropologist, senior research fellow at the Kinsey Institute, and chief science advisor to Match.com. She uses brain scanning, fMRI machines, to study the neural systems associated with the sex drive, romantic love, attachment, rejection, love addiction, and long-term partnership happiness. Now you guys all know why we've been excited to get her on the show. She has written six books on lust, romance, and attachment, which are now sold in 27 countries. Among them, the, some of the titles are Why We Love, Why Him, Why Her, and Anatomy of Love, which is in its second edition. Fisher is currently studying the biological basis of personality and partnership compatibility using her questionnaire, the Fisher Temperament Inventory, which has been taken by 15 million people in 40 countries and validated with two extensive fMRI brain scanning studies. But wait, there's more. Dr. Fisher studies and expounds on courtship trends in the digital age using exclusive data from 60,000 singles in America. Fisher appears regularly on national and international TV, radio, and podcasts. She does keynote speeches regularly around the world. She is a TED All-Star. That's how I fell in love with Dr. Helen Fisher. Uh, you've done amazing TED Talks, but uh, gosh, I mean, that's that's really how I fell in love with you in watching one of those. Um, these have been viewed over 21 million times. Uh, and finally, uh, Dr. Fisher was chosen in 2015 by Business Insider as one of the 15 most amazing women in science. To me, there is number one, and that's her. And finally, she's a dear friend of mine for more than a decade and a longtime friend to your tango. Welcome, Helen Fisher. I am delighted to be with you. Yeah, we are so delighted to have you. Uh, and we were talking about before the show started, this is only going to be a seven hour episode. So whoever yeah. is, is listening or watching, you know, just get comfortable. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> get a pillow. <laughs> yeah, get a pillow. Just get comfortable. All right. Um, so we have a ton to cover, but let me kick off by saying, I I found this out recently. I mean, there was an amazing um, profile of, I mean, many amazing profiles, but the one in particular recently was from The Atlantic. It was fantastic. And I uh, 
found out that you are the single most quoted person on love, which says a lot. That is a really big superlative. You've researched it extensively. You've written and spoken on it exhaustively in, from a scientific perspective, which is, I know, a very big differentiator. So I want to start by asking, what is the number one thing people get wrong about love? Oh, boy. The thing they is get wrong. Is that a wrong. long list? Uh, <laughs> is that like number one to ten? Um, well, they don't know what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's not that they even got it wrong. It's interesting. When I, when I wrote my first academic article, on romantic love, uh, one of the four academic reviewers said, you can't study this. It's part of the supernatural. And oh. I thought to myself, hang on here. I mean, you know, anger is not part of the supernatural. Uh, fear is not part of the supernatural. Depression is uh -huh. not part of the supernatural. Why would this basic brain system be part of the supernatural? Uh, and, you know, I mean, as I've you, I've heard, as I've said to you, Andrea, you know, I mean, people pine for love. They live for love. They kill for love and they die for love. I don't believe yeah. that's part of the supernatural. So, mm -hmm. see, but what do they really get wrong about love? Well, there's one thing that nobody will agree with me on. Probably you won't either. I actually, well, first of all, we've evolved three distinctly different brain systems from mating and reproduction. Sex drive being one, feelings of intense romantic love being the second, and feelings of deep attachment being the third. They're, they're run by different uh, neurochemical systems. Uh, they evolve for different reasons, et cetera. But one of the things that I think that people have wrong, and I, you, nobody was going to agree with me on this, I actually don't think that romantic love takes work. Hmm. Um, okay. I think, you know, I mean, you know, we, I mean, it takes uh, compromise. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it takes being aware of the other person's feelings and knowing how to reach them. Um, it takes doing some things that you might not do otherwise, no question about that, but real mm -hmm. work, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, I mean, we, we, you know, we compromise all of our lives as, you know, at, at school, at, at work, uh, with our friends, mm -hmm. uh, with our family, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that in a good relationship, it actually does take work. Now, almost nobody mm -hmm. will agree with me, but that's where I stand. I love it. Um, okay. So that was... Uh, a, a kind of a broader perspective, the number one thing people get wrong about love. Do you have an opinion on the number one thing that therapists, like marriage therapists and, and that ilk, that they get wrong about love? Mm. I think they don't understand that it's a an addiction. Uh, and oh. so, uh, you know, I mean, you know, as you know, I've put over 100, I and my colleagues have put over 100 people into the brain scanner studying the brain circuitry of romantic love, happily people, uh -huh. happily in love. Uh, people rejected in love and people in in love long term, not just loving, but in love long term. We've proven that you, right. you can remain in love long term. You've got to pick the right person. But, Hang on, I want to just, for all the people listening, you can remain in love over the long run, right? Because I think a lot of people don't necessarily don't feel like that. that. Right? They don't believe so it. So that's how there is hope here on open relationships. <laughs> They think they're stated that first you fall, you know, yeah. mad, first you have sex, then you fall madly in love, and then you move into attachment. In a really good relationship, you carry all three during the course of it. Sex continues mm -hmm. to be good. The intense romance can in continue to be good as long as you're doing novel things together. I mean, there's reasons to keep all this together. But, uh, but to answer your question, Andrea, you mm -hmm. know, I I've seen therapists say, well, you know, just leave them. Leave her. Uh -huh. You're addicted mm -hmm. to the person. It is a natural addiction. We have found that in the brain when you're madly in love happily and when you're in and when you've been rejected in love and even in love long term. I mean, the basic mm -hmm. brain region called the nucleus accumbens becomes active in, in when you're in love with somebody, whether they love you back or not. And that particular mm -hmm. brain region, the nucleus accumbens, is becomes active with all of the addictions. Um mm. all of the um uh, substance ad uh, abuse, like alcohol, mm -hmm. cigarettes, heroin, whatever, and all the behavioral addictions like gambling or sex addiction. And it is an addiction. And you can know more about it. You can this and that. But you have to treat it as an addiction. Throw out the cards and letters if it's not working. Don't write. Don't call. Don't show up. Um, you know, I mean, if you're going to give up alcohol, you don't leave a bottle of vodka on your desk. Well, you can't leave pictures of them. You know, you don't yeah. want to throw out jewelry, but or if you got some, or <laughs> if it's a really good stuff from Tiffany, don't throw it out. If it's a plastic crap, you know, or from his mom, <laughs> put it in the closet. 
don't look at yeah. it don't show it and then and go off and do do good things with your i mean there's so much that you can do i mean i can go into all sure. this in great detail but the answer to the question is i think an awful lot of people don't realize that it is an addiction that the person is in an addictive state um mm -hmm. they are not thinking they know that they're not thinking clearly but they don't mm -hmm. really know why and so i think they've got to add that component uh to their therapy Mm -hmm. uh, that's super interesting. I mean, in many of our conversations, you've invoked what is Darwinian, and we'll come back to some of the reason, you know, really fascinating research that um, you shared uh, just recently with me. Um, but it's interesting to think about when you talk about love being addictive, that 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 there it seems like there is something Darwinian, right? Because oh from, God, yes, you know, in terms of procreation, as Absolutely. well as I mean, there's a, a loneliness epidemic happening yeah. in America and much of the Western world and maybe elsewhere. Um, and so it, it makes a lot of sense to me that it's like, um, th you know, this is a not a nice to have, it's a need to have. And yet, I, I call say, it a survival mechanism. It evolved yeah. as a survival mechanism. And by the way, mm -hmm. you know, feelings of romantic love, um, it's not an emotion. I had thought that it was an emotion, that the mm -hmm. high to low and this and that. And but it's not. It's way below the brain pathways for oh. feelings of intense romantic love lie way below the brain regions for uh, the emotions. In fact, the basic brain region is called the um, um, VTA, the ventral, I, what, what's wrong with me? And the uh, tegmental area, the ventral tegmental area. It's a little factory that lies actually, and it, it pumps out dopamine. And that's what gives you the the sure. thrill, the joys, the optimism, the focus, the motivation, the craving, the whole deal. But it lies right next to the brain region uh, that orchestrates thirst and hunger. Wow. Thirst and hunger keep you alive today. Romantic love drives you to form a partnership, at least for a while, and send sure. your DNA into tomorrow. And, mm -hmm. it's, 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 and that's what it evolved as as a brain mechanism to send your DNA to, to into tomorrow. Cause that's the only way we survive. I mean, as Darwin would have said, he said, you know, uh, you know, if you have four children and I have no children, you live on and I die out. So this is a mm -hmm. very powerful yeah. brain. System. By the way, back to the addiction part. One thing that nobody is ex will accept except for me someday they will is actually, I think it evolved as a, as a positive addiction to enable you to overlook all kinds of things so that you could move forward with this individual and have babies and, and send your DNA into tomorrow. I tried to re do this in a recent academic article, but in America and the world, actually, the word addiction is always bad. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't able to uh, convince any of my colleagues on the, but they took those paragraphs out that I had written about. It could be, have evolved. Oh my God, Helen, are, they can are those academics canceling you? Gosh darn it. I do not I approve. Forever. <laughs> they cancel each other too. I'm not the only one. Oh good. Okay, good. You're you're striking back. No, but I, I, that, oh, no, I mean, that, it's super on. interesting. I'm yeah. just moving on. Just I just moving you, know, on. you gotta you gotta leave your footprint and and I'll just do it whether people agree or not agree. By the way, I mean I you I wonder if you guys do that too, but I I, I regularly lie in bed at night and I think to myself what do I believe now that I hmm. won't believe in five years? What am I hanging oh. on to? And there's one thing that I've been hanging on to for decades. What's that? And all of the data shows that men uh, uh, are more sexual than women. I just don't believe it. I just, maybe oh. I don't want to believe it. Maybe mm -hmm. my experience is different. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, it's, if you measure how many times you have a fantasy or let's say, I mean, it's, it, I think it's how you measure it. I think mm -hmm. they're also measuring only the young. And I oh. think that mm -hmm. after menopause, as estrogen levels go down in women on masking levels of testosterone, a lot of uh, middle-aged women actually can become more sexual. The problem is they're not necessarily sexual with their husband. If you get them back on the job market. <laughs> um, oh my God, that's the problem. You know, that is the problem. But I, I do think that it's how you how you really measure this stuff. I mean, if you if you ask who, what you think about all the time, men think about it more. If you ask okay. how long the orgasm is for women, women beat them by a country mile with uh -huh. more attractions per sexual bout, uh, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I think it's more complicated than just mm. off the cuff saying that 
men are more sexual than women. One thing that's really interesting, you know, I do this all this data with um, called Singles in America with Match.com. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, on the 60,000 people, well, 5,000 every year, we cook, cook up about 200 questions. We get them, we poll about 5,000 people. We do not poll match members. It's a national representative sample based okay. on the U.S. Senate. So it's real, it's real, um, it's real science. And one mm-hmm. of the questions I asked a couple of years ago was, you know, why do you go into a one night stand? And mm. men were two to three times more likely to go into a one night stand hoping that this would trigger the beginning of a partnership. Oh, okay. Men than women. Yeah. And sorry, what was that stat again? Two to three more so, times likely? Uh, two to three men are two to three times more likely to go into a one night stand hoping mm-hmm. that this encounter will um will trigger a longer partnership. They are more interested in having a one night stand to trigger uh you know to trigger a relationship. And by the way, men fall in love faster than women. There's a whole lot of data on that. They fall in love more often than women. When they meet somebody that they are in love with, they they want to introduce them to friends and family sooner. It's probably mate guarding, uh, a mm-hmm. good ethological well, term. They, they they more wanna... they're more likely to die of a broken heart, right? If, if yes, somebody um, you know a, a man loses his mate, um, he's much more literally uh, likely to die heartbroken. I mean, so it's it's very physiological. Really smart. And you know what they explain? They say, "Oh well, now he doesn't have somebody to cook for him." Real, oh. that's absurd. You know, yeah. I mean, he, he, he's lost his mate. There's Uber Eats. And, yeah. And they're 200 times more likely to kill themselves. Men are two and a half times more likely to kill yeah. themselves. When Men are the fragile sex. I have been trying to tell the women's magazines that for 40 years. They're dedicated <laughs> to thinking that women are the rom- most romantic. My great-grandfather was, uh, I mean, he was in the Marines. He was uh, tough to, like, uh, uh literally at you know 85 would be running miles in the morning doing hundreds of push-ups like this Hardcore. guy was active he, yeah. he was an alpha dude and, yeah exactly like the most alpha dude and mm-hmm. he um when his wife died uh six months later he died like oh, it was yeah. it, like literally wow. like textbook like died of a broken heart oh, like he just mm. it, and it, like there was no health problems no nothing God. It's striking. I mean, the data is the more data that I discover about the the um, uh, inextricable link between our physiological well being. I mean, I feel like we all get the emotional uh, connection, but the physiological connection is is real. Absolutely, it's called body loops. You know, Damasio wrote body about loops. It. I've body never lo- I, body. I'm trying to like body loops. Okay, I've never heard of that phrase. That's cool. Yeah, uh-huh. and basically, you know, you feel fear. You think about fear. You see the taxi cab about to run over you, and what do you feel? It you feel it in your stomach. Your heart starts to pound. Yeah. You you get dry in the mouth. You know, I mean, it's all connected. It's all connected. Yeah. It's interesting, Helen. It seems like much of what your your findings uh, support run counter to traditional gender roles or ideas about you know dominance and and. Uh, it sounds like the women are ultimately the decision makers and that the men are the puppy dogs with the, the tongues uh, <laughs> being dragged on the floor, if you will. Wagging. Well, you know, uh, I don't see men as puppy dogs, thank God. Um, but uh, there's no qu- I wrote an old book on gender differences in the brain. It was killed in one week by people who didn't believe that there were any differences, which is absurd. Um, oh, wow. But the bottom line is, and I and I have all this data on these sixty thousand people, and you're absolutely right, Jonas, that uh, uh, women are the picky sex, mm. and and men are much more mentally flexible about you know they'll stay in a relationship longer, et cetera, et cetera. That you know women are the picky sex. But that seems like Darwinian also, right? What? I mean, that's Darwinian also, right? Because absolutely. if I'm gonna if I'm gonna bear a you know person who's a little you know flaky, I don't I don't want to uh, sort of um, fertilize his seed only to find that I'm, you know, I'm a single mom or, or what have you. Right. So that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, oh, absolutely. That, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, from a Darwinian perspective, I mean, look, the women, I mean, everywhere in the world, uh, women take the, the large majority of basic child care during the first yeah. four years. 
Now, mm-hmm. that's not to say that men aren't involved. It's amazing how these people say, oh, the man's not doing anything. What is he doing? For millions of years, he was out facing lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I mean, they were doing something for the family, but they weren't wiping the diapers and, you know, and, and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And so, I mean, and for, for many, many, probably millions of years, it, childbirth was hard. I mean, up until very recently in human evolution, women died in childbirth. Oh, yeah. I remember giving birth and remind, and I ended up having two uh, emergency C-sections. I was one of those oh. women who's like, C-sections are so lame. Those women that have C-sections are so weak. And I was like, oh, shit, it's me. So that's what I guess <laughs> karma for judging. Um, no, but what I was told, you know, I'd heard this phrase before and I felt like it after 20 hours of labor. And it was like my water broke and it was just worse. One foot in the grave when you're giving yeah. birth, right? And oh. it's scary. I mean, holy smokes, is it ever scary when you're, I, w- I remember thinking I'm between a rock and a hard place. I'm not dilating. I'm in pain. I'm exhausted. This baby's going nowhere. And, you know, thank goodness for the folks at uh, Roosevelt Hospital. They, you know, got me that epidural and, you know, yay, yay, yay. yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, but it but it is. I mean, it, it is very much that. Um, it's scary. I mean, yeah. I mean, I remember my twin sister, you know, she was just really big and she looks at me and says, Helen, it has to come out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. And, and we worship women for that. All these fertility figures that go back 40,000 years and, you know, drawings on cave walls. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, women were, were, were and then men still do, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh but anyway, there are gender differences in the brain, as Jonas was starting in on, and and uh, for good reasons. I mean, uh, you don't want to have, have, have everybody be exactly alike. I mean, a million years ago, you had to have some people who were good at uh, spatial relations and some people who were good at talking, for God's sakes, you know? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and we put our heads together. I mean, I think men and women are like two feet. They need each other to get ahead, but they oh, are I not. Oh, I love that. Yeah. You know, I mean, totally. we do. Have, some women have a lot of high estrogen traits. I mean, I certainly, a lot of my girlfriends are high, uh, high testosterone. I mean, you know, a lot of my girlfriends are, they could fix my computer for God's sakes. I can't, you know, um, you know, they're mathematically skilled and they understand all the new tech stuff. And Mm -hmm. they got a lot of, I mean, I, as you mentioned, you know, I've done this questionnaire that's been taken by in 40 countries. uh, And you, you certainly see a wide mix of all these traits. You know, I mean, I'm an identical twin and even the two of us are not alike. But yeah. there's patterns to nature, there's patterns to culture, and there's patterns in the brain. And on average, there are some real gender differences, both of which uh, are are essential for survival. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to go back to the Darwinian uh, uh, research, the sort of research that has um, its roots in Darwinianism, um, Darwinism that you were sharing um, on our prep call in terms of the three things that are most prevalent in terms of how we're sizing up a, um, a potential mate, because I, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, okay. Well, first, I think I told you that when they put people in a, an fMRI brain scanner, they, they, they found that the first two things that the brain actually does is um, size you up to, for, to find out whether uh, si- sizes up the person to see if they are physically attractive to you. Mm-hmm. And um, the other thing is whether they are uh, mentally attractive. But what you're referring to is something mm-hmm. else. Once again, in this Match.com uh, Singles in America study, once again, we don't study the Match people. This is a national representative sample. And I asked the question was, you know, what are the first three things, or what are the first things that you notice about somebody but you just don't know at all? And of course, mm-hmm. I had about 20 boxes you can check, and people checked a lot of boxes, but over 90% of, of singles of all ages check these three boxes first a box mm-hmm. the first thing they notice is your teeth your grammar and your self-confidence and you know when i was working on this with my friends at match and justin garcia who works with us from the kinsey institute i thought to myself they thought well that's pretty weird but then i thought about yeah. well your teeth say your age and your health mm-hmm. your grammar says your background mm-hmm. uh and yeah. your your self-confidence shows your psychological stability. So the brain is very well built to size people up. And by the way, it's so interesting. All these people are so down on dating sites. First of all, they're not dating sites. All they do is introduce you. All they do is introduce. Mm-hmm. That's all they are. 
In fact, we don't know how to use them. They're too new, so people binge, and that's a mistake. But the bottom line is, <laughs> I asked another question about um, what are you looking for in a sex partner? Mm -hmm. And I was also just checking. I thought, oh, you know, body, breast, whatever. And you yeah, know, yeah. Self-confidence was the main thing that mm -hmm. both men and women want is somebody who is confident. Not overly confident. Totally. Not a, I'm not a jerk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's interesting, Helen. So... One of the questions that comes to mind when you mention that self-confidence, and maybe this is the hyper um, result of it, is that sort of the whole, the bad boy or the the asshole. Why is it that women are attracted to those books? Is it in, t in part tied to self-confidence? That's a good idea, Jonas. It's a really good <laughs> idea. Do you mind if I borrow it from you? <laughs> yeah, the next um, article from Helen Fisher on your tango is, why the bad boy, why the asshole? <laughs> Let brain science uh, point the way. <laughs> My guess is that uh, they're charismatic. They're probably high dopamine, high testosterone. Women go for high testosterone men. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, for millions of years, the high testosterone guy is more likely to hit that buffalo in the head with a rock and bring home a nice big fat feast. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, along with the guy who's a lot of bravado and everything, it's probably a guy who's, I mean, I've never studied it. I don't know. But you would think that that kind of bravado, as long as he doesn't go over the edge, really we way over the edge. Mm -hmm. He might be the kind that talks him into a very fancy job, has more money, can can help you raise your babies with more resources, et cetera, et cetera. So there is some reason that women are attracted to the, to the bad boy. I do think, though, it's become less since the pandemic. We've got data on that. The bad boy, you know, oh, so we've asked every single year. Uh, I've done this study since 2010. That's 12 years. We're about to start 13. Um, we ask, you know, what are you looking for? And um, every year they say somebody who respects me, somebody who I can trust and confide in, somebody who makes me laugh. That's very important. Laughter is for very important Darwinian reasons. Laughter is important. Uh, drives up uh -huh. the dopamine system. Can really get you through some bad times. Um, somebody who is um, attractive and somebody who makes enough time for me. But the, since the pandemic, one of the outstanding new things is somebody uh, who is um, a mature, emotionally oh, mature. Yay! Can we uh, can we give a big clap to uh, to maturity? I mean, amen, right? They're grown up. You yeah. can't lock up somebody for two years and have them come out the same. And yeah, and singles have grown up. Yeah, I have a theory on this if you guys, uh, if you'll humor me for a second. So traditionally, yeah, Jonas, what you're talking about as far as the the asshole, like getting the girl and then the the nice guys are like, why, why, why do women like assholes? Um, so I grew up as like an observer a lot, like kind of a wallflower. And uh, the one thing that I definitely noticed, it's not that they're an asshole necessarily. They are, but it's that they make themselves available with like hmm. reckless abandon, right? Like they are the type of person that if there is a group of like five women, they'll hit on the first girl and then they'll hit on the second one and they'll hit on the third one. Like they have no fear of rejection. They don't take it personally. They don't so they're whatever. They're not assholes. Like, they're uh, psychopaths. They're <laughs> addicts. Uh, yes. <laughs> they're but, addicts. But, they're love addicts. But, yes. But, but that's the thing is like, you know, eventually it works. It's a numbers game, right? And so, like, hmm. yes, they do get, you know, laid every day because they don't, like, stop until they do. You know what yeah. I mean? And but it's it, an interesting theory, right, where somebody uh, else, maybe you, would be um, more scrupulous and a little more thoughtful. Oh, I'm terrified. Oh, oh, like when I would be at a bar you might be or whatever. And terrified. Okay, got it. Oh, I mean, when yeah. you're like a, at a bar or whatever, you're go, like you have the mental conversation and going like, oh, but like, what if that makes me sound dumb or like, or like, what if she says no or like, uh, like, what if she calls me ugly? I don't know. Like, just you know, everybody. Right. You're so handsome. Ways. Come on. Everybody has that um, anxiety. It's just that these, you know. By the way, and there's a lot of anthropology that puts men into two two types: the cad and the dad. And 
you know, and you're more like the dad, I guess. I mean, I don't know if oh, the children... cat or the dad. I thought you said cat or bad. I was no. like, aren't those the same? Okay, cat, cat or dad. Or Got it. D-A-D. I mean, they huh. will divide men into those two things. Oh, there's all all those all kinds of things in between and all that kind of stuff. But um, they've done various studies of what how the cat would respond and the dad would respond. And um, but anyway, I do think that everybody's uh, attracted to some people who are char- charismatic. They're yeah. very drawn to that. I was going to say, I think da- uh, Brian Dad could go to Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, the other one I wanted to go back to. We've we've talked a little bit about sex. You were talking about how America is sex negative, which I just I want you to I want you to expound on that. But I just I want to give some context because this is I think it's probably where pornography um, started. I think a lot of us in digital media would credit the pornography industry for making the web, um, at least getting the, the roots, right? Obviously, there's way more than pornography that's, um, you know, made the internet the force that it is today. But it was a massive uh, propellant um, early on, right? And we have a lot of very provocative um, programming and, and literature, right? And, and yet, um, you have a theory about sex america as being sex negative so talk to us about that yeah it's not even my theory it's just very well known in the sex community that when you take a look at people around the world that americans are are much much more they call us a sex negative society one of the things Mm. is we've got a long history of relating sex with sin with religion right and in asia it's it's another part of the social life it is not connected with buddhism or Shintoism or you know whatever oh, uh, well and you so, see a lot of you see a lot of in Asian art the phallic symbols right absolutely. and and in a in India the um um uh, Kama Sutra right so now I'm connecting those dots where they glorified it right you don't absolutely. see a lot of glorified sexual art from America do you no in fact you know the kiss I mean, brand, uh, uh, uh you know uh sculpture the kiss when it first was shown, it had to be shown behind a a a, a curtain, and only certain people could go, and you could take a wow. look at it. Yes, we've got a long. I think we're breaking out of it, but I do mm-hmm. find, you know, I do find that the young are what what uh, I would call the new Victorians. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think that they are as sexual, certainly as my generation. I'm mean, I'm a boomer, um, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I I don't think they're prudes about thinking about it. I think they're just so busy trying to get ahead and i think they which is also a problem right because if they're not spending more time thinking about sex and and in pursuit and and so forth i I was chatting with my my son about and we were joking about covetous eyes right we're talking about like ice cream or something but it's like if you don't have those covetous eyes doesn't that that one more reason for a fucking loneliness epidemic right like if people are just too busy trying to get ahead and they're not getting laid no wonder they're lonely right well, there's no question about it that, you know, sex is good for you. I mean, relationships yeah. are good for you. I mean, people in a good relationship live five to seven years longer. I mean, we were built to form partnerships. Wow. And, you know, that's important. And the sex drive, I mean, you know, when sex is good for you, I mean, any kind of um, good sex drives up testosterone, uh, which is gives both men and women a good deal of energy and focus mm-hmm. and motivation. Uh, any stimulation of the genitals drives up the dopamine system, gives you optimism, feelings of romance. And with orgasm, there's a real flood of oxytocin linked with feelings of deep attachment. So, yeah, um, um, you know, it also uh, boosts the immune system. Uh, it's good for the heart rate and respiration and uh, mm-hmm. boosts the endorphins for pain relief and promotes sleep and elevates mood. I mean, sex is good for you. Now, they will get to it. I mean, it's amazing. In my day, everybody was so appalled that we were having too much sex. And now, of course, they're appalled that they're not having enough. So, right. I mean, you know, it's amazing how the press, when it, if it bleeds, it leaves, you know, they, yeah. you're just going for the bad of everything, but uh, they'll get to it. Um, I'm crazy about millennials and Gen Z, people of reproductive mm-hmm. age. They're, they're so dedicated. And, you know, they're so, defi- they're defining sex. I, I heard yesterday about, uh, a study, maybe you sent it to me about demisexual. Never heard oh. that term before. Yeah, um, but all these terms like DTR define the relationship. Now, I mean, they want to know 
where they stand. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in the one night, uh, uh, even in Friends with Benefits, they which they coined that term, which mm-hmm. is good. We always had Friends with Benefits, but they named it. They've named, yep. I mean, Sheen and Ghosting and all of these things have a name now. They were always going on. There's nothing new about the behavior, but they're defining it. They're really defining sex. They're defining relationships. And of all of them, the most interesting to me was this define the relationship, DTR. So I did a study of this in my Singles in America studies with Match. And I said, well, to 5,000 people. And I said, well, at what point in a beginning of a relationship do you have that define the relationship conversation? Where are we heading? Are we going to be committed? Are we going to be faithful? You know, blah, blah, blah. And the answer, the average answer was four months. No. Oh. Now, I don't know whether you wow. think that's a lot or a little, but as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't have dreamt of mm-hmm. asking a man after four mm-hmm. months uh, where, now maybe that's me. Do you mm-hmm. think that's a lot or a little? You're younger than I feel like it's, what were you going to say, Brian? I said that's a long time, I think. Me too. I was going to say the same <laughs> thing. I mean, I guess it depends on how much, how how much contact in in those four months, right? If you're right. like kind of talking, texting once or twice a week, right, and it's sort of slow, like that slow build. Um, so here's the definition of of demisexuality, by the way. Um, and and actually, I I think it's kind of cool. Anyone who defines themselves this way, it's a sexual orientation in which someone feels sexually attracted to someone only after they've developed a close emotional bond with them. That so they healthy. get in touch with them emotionally first. They don't even see them as a sexual object or uh, attractiveness mm-hmm. until they've formed the bond. And then that bond is what gives them the sexual attraction. That's interesting. That's interesting. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That forever. I mean, that's the way I was. For yeah. God's sake. Right. Nothing cool about it. Yeah. But what's interesting is then if you read the article that I read yesterday, and I thought um, that's the description of it. But then they say that this person is somewhere lies on a continuum between asexual and really sexual. So they're defining this person who's all the person is, is picky. And they're defining <laughs> it as sexual. I think that's absurd. Yeah. I, I it sounds healthy, quite honestly. I, I mean really I do. just you know, I mean I, I I happen to um I think everybody knows the story. For me it was love at first sight when I met when I, I first laid eyes on my husband. I was like, game over. And I was working <laughs> for him and that was a problem. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, I was totally, totally crushed out, right? So it's just, it's a it's a different, um, you know, totally different system, right? And I've had those other boyfriends where I've gotten to know them. And I guess, so I guess I'm demisexual and not demisexual. I mean. I, I think we all are at times. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you make a mistake and you're in bed with somebody <laughs> who you <laughs> just met and you regret it or you don't, whatever. But uh but I do. I I think it's quite natural. I I don't even know why they call it demi. Yeah. I would say- oh, let me let me come back to you on that. I, I meant to ask it before. Just rewinding to the research around. You said two men are two to three more times likely to um to use a one night stand as a an entryway to a relationship. I feel like I've read advice and probably maybe those bad women's magazines that you reference. I feel like I've read the advice that says, hey, ladies, if you want a long term relationship, don't do a one night stand. So do women exactly. have a, a different perception on one night stands? Apparently, as, from what you're seeing, apparently they see it much more negatively. Yeah. And, and maybe that's adaptive, too, because for millions of years, you get pregnant in that one night stand. I mean, they've got more to lose. Yeah, there's a it's a high yeah it's a high risk. I mean that's Darwinian. But I wanted to come back and the back to the sex is sin, right? Because for for women, forever. Uh, not that I'm a, a student of history, but it just it feels like a long time that there's been slut shaming, right? Oh, and yeah. if you're a woman that um, you know if you've slept around in high school or college, you get labeled, you're slut shamed, and I mean I have one friend in particular. It was pleasure. And she wasn't having any of the, the you know, so- society's labels. For her, it was pleasure. Uh, she was confident. I wish I could have had some of that because I, I felt like I was a good girl. I was like, ooh, you know, like, I, I don't, I don't want to have that, that negative label. But it's, un- it's unfortunate, right? Because oh, yeah. they're, to your point, that there's so many benefits. I mean, yes, there's risk, right, from STDs to unwanted pregnancies, you know, and then to your point, you know, you have sex, it's, uh, you know, the uh, um, affection isn't reciprocated, you feel really badly, right? So they're, they're negative to it too, but it's just, 
it's tough that we live in a society that I feel like maybe we've come a, a long way. I mean, it feels a little zigzaggy because I think in the 60s, yeah, sexual revolution, you know, into the 70s. But I'll tell you, as I was a you know, child of the 80s and 90s, I didn't feel sexually liberated. I felt like I had to be a good girl. And I don't I mean, how has that changed? I think people are much more relaxed about sex. I really do. I think uh -huh. that a great many of them are actually using sex uh, as a sex interview. <laughs> In one of my studies, oh, I yeah, found that makes sense. That um, about 36% of singles in America today have had sex with somebody before the first date. Now, oh, hey. that's insane. About 36% sex before the first date. But I think what they're doing is they're moving from the one I stand into the friends with benefits. And I just think they're checking the person out. I mean, you mm -hmm. actually learn a lot between the sheets, you know, not only whether they're any good in bed, but are they kind? Can they listen? Can they be patient? Uh, are they sweet to you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and these days you really don't have to walk the walk of shame. Um, most people have figured out how to not get pregnant except, problems mm -hmm. now with this Roe v. Wade issue, but, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, uh, and most people have figured out how to not get diseases. So I do think that it is for some people, 36% are having their sex interview to find out who somebody's like, and by the way, I don't know where everybody else lives, but in New York city, a first date can cost you a hundred dollars and the young yeah. don't have the kind of money. So they want to see whether they really like the person before the first date. And, the sex interview is part of it. I mean, I, I'm not condoning sex it or not. Interview. I don't think I've ever heard that phrase. Okay, body lube, sex interview. I'm getting a whole new lexicon today. My my fiance and her friends, they're uh, more Gen Z, like millennial cusp. And they they all subscribe to that idea like wholeheartedly, Helen. Like they um, believe that like people can learn a lot from each other with sex. And especially like how someone treats you afterwards and everything Absolutely. is so important yeah. so it's like they they literally said exactly what you do they're like oh we get that out of the way first to even know if that's like even a compatibility thing because if not then we're I, I wasting like a ton gals. of time i want to hang with those mm -hmm. gals they, they sound like uh, cool. my kind of ladies well you know another thing <laughs> I did, another study with singles in america um i asked have you ever really begun to like somebody and then had the first kiss and the first kiss was so awful oh, that you do and? it again and over 50 percent said yes that the wow. first kiss was a kiss of death and that happened to me once too oh boy never stop again <laughs> never again that's it game never over again. it's an important part of life you know it's an important part of most relationships and like all other parts of the relationship uh you, you got to find a way to have it be a lot of fun yeah i, I also wonder though helen you know with regard to this uh the sex interview is that a uniquely American thing? And is one, and then two, is it also a product of the fact that we live in a time of dating apps and that dating apps facilitates that that approach instead of something a little more traditional, long-winded, where you get to know someone first before you get physical with them? I would imagine that the sex interview is is very common in throughout Europe and much of South America in urban, in urban society, in urban cultures, you know. I mean, I talk to journalists all over the world and, um, you know, I, uh, a, a woman from Russia before the, uh, the Ukrainian issue, uh, uh, called and, and she said that this concept of, of, um, you know, the new Victorians, uh, new Victorians, uh, was very common in, 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 in Russia. And then I asked a woman from Brazil, well, I hadn't heard this thing about the new Victorians and it's not yet popular in America, the term. Uh, and the women from Brazil said, oh, yes, it's quite common back here. So uh, down there. So uh, but I would guess there's a certain uh, I think the young are pretty liberated and they're going to hop into bed. And I mean, that's my term of sex interview. And, and my guess is that it's pretty common everywhere in urban societies where women are mm -hmm. college educated and have some of their uh, their own resources. I mean, that's what's really, you know, people are always talking about how technology is changing the world all these dating sites are doing is enabling us to do the same old thing we're just meeting yeah. in, in in a different way i mean what a million years ago they 
they met around a water hole in the desert. Mm -hmm. You know, a thousand years ago, they, they met at a barn dance and farmland. And, you know, in my day, we, we met in a bar or on the beach or whatever, and now they're meeting on the internet. So I don't think that that is, uh, Joan, as you asked, you know, is, is making as large a contribution as one would think. But I do think that women piling into the job market uh, and and getting their own resources and et cetera is liberating their sexuality. Now, the young aren't expressing it the way my generation did, um, but I think they're quite comfortable with it. And, and a good many of them are going to have their one night stands and and I don't think it's... Uh, and we don't judge them for it. We encourage it. Hey, Helen, I want to ask you, um, speaking of um, where we meet people, you have a great uh, romance in your life, a long lasting romance in your life, and it's fitting as a ho hopeless romantic. Um, how did you meet John? And I'm going to, of course, ask about um, your political differences, because we here on Open Relationships, we want to help people realize you can have a lot of differences, even uh, diametrically opposed politically, and you can still be like smoking into each, like smoking hot into each other. So how did you meet John? And um, yeah, woo, all right. So how did you meet John? And, and you have a sweet engagement story. So I just want to, you know, I want to be Wait, regaled with I can all that good the stuff. Story and then you can tell you about the political differences. So two yeah, separate things. Please do. Well, first of all, he wrote for uh, the New York Times for 21 years. So he was an on-staff uh, journalist. And, and so he was writing would... in the sci science, a science writer, right? So big brainiac. Uh, yes. He, yes. He's much smarter than I am. It's absolutely gorgeous. I absolutely adore him. Um, I'm crazy about him, and we've been going out for nine years. I'm I'm as in love with him as when I first met him. Anyway, he used to inter in, inter uh, he used to interview me quite often, so I knew the name, you know. But uh -huh. I've never in my life put my put the make on a on a business person, and particularly if they're interviewing me. But anyway, so uh, in 2014, we were invited out to a very very fancy ranch with 41 horses. And anyway, he mm -hmm. was there, and I was there, and about 20 journalists and scientists were there together for a week. And I just thought he was so cool. And, but anyway, uh, it was getting over a horrible divorce. I mean, a mm -hmm. really horrendous yeah. mess. Yeah. He gave me a, a ride, just the two of us, back to the Bozeman airport, two and a half hours from this junction. And he's driving along and he's saying, he's saying, I'm never going out with another woman. Never. I'm never, ever, ever going out with another woman. And I think to myself, well, I'm the only one in the car. <laughs> he's telling me something. So anyway, for, for about a year, we uh, every two months or so, he'd invite me to the opera or some sort of the movies or something, and we would go, and he'd give me a big hug at the subway, and that was that. Mm -hmm. So finally, the day came. We were going to go. Uh, we both live in New York. We were going to go out down to Chelsea and have dinner and then walk the High Line, which is a beautiful walk, mm -hmm. and then go play pool. Uh, I don't know what got into me. I was not planning this in advance. We were having a drink. I pulled my coaster out from the drink, little you know, uh, paper coaster. And I, and I said, why don't we write down on this secretly on our coasters, what we would like to win if we win at pool. Oh, so I wrote down Ooh. a real kiss. I didn't know what he wrote down. So uh -huh. we walked down and we go play pool and he creams me at pool. He'd been growing up with a pool table and I <laughs> had not played more than five times in my life. So I opened his little napkin and it says, <laughs> Sex and clarity. Woo! All right, go for it, John. Well, I like I, this. Well, that's the sex part. I got that one figured out. But what do you have in mind by clarity? Uh huh. I don't know. And so he said, "Well, he just wanted to be friends with benefits. He wasn't ready for any kind of relationship." Mm -hmm. So we were now walking north on Park Avenue from way down at the village, and it was way too late to do anything that night. And I said to him, "I said, you know, I study love for all my life, and." Uh -huh. When you start to have sex with somebody, you can trigger the brain circuitry for a romantic love. Are yeah. you willing to take that chance? Oh, and he said no. yes. <sighs> and five years later, he asked me to Okay, but tell that tell that <laughs> story because I, I think, I feel like you, I, I know I have a shadow recollection of it, but I feel like it has to do with Montana and the ranch. And and, and I think, didn't you say to him, you're, or, I feel like there was something else about somebody never getting married, but but I'm missing. Oh, yeah. Can I you tell the story? I'm happy to marry you, but uh, I'm not moving in. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, and uh, I mean, he was rather astonished that I wasn't. I mean, here I am. I'm over seventy-five now, and you know, I mean, 
he figured that I would be like a cougar, you know, just dying to marry. It didn't even dawn on uh-huh. me to marry him. I, I thought, well, I'd give him anything I own. I, I'm never going to leave him, but I didn't think of marrying him. And yeah. then when he asked me to marry him, I said, well, yes, I, 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 yes, I'd love to marry you, but I'm not moving in. <laughs> and uh, and so this is my apartment, and he's got an mm-hmm. apartment in the Bronx, and we go back and forth. And mm-hmm. tonight, uh, I won't see him. I'm going to go out to a uh, a speech on the brain mm-hmm. for the neuroscientists. And he, he loves reading all night and doing his own thing. Uh-huh. So a couple nights a week, we, we just play, maybe sometimes even three, but we but we trust each other. You got to do this kind of thing with somebody you trust. And it was so interesting yeah. because one time I was saying that we were LAT, living apart together. And I was talking to uh-huh. a young man. <laughs> he was maybe in his late 20s. And he had gotten married recently and he had a child who was like six months old. And I was saying to him about living apart together and all this. And he said, oh, Helen, if, the, if, if just one night a week, I could just spend the night even in a hotel and eat uh-huh. when I want to and this and that. And there was a third woman third person listening to this conversation and the woman said to us well i bet your wife wouldn't want to do that and we both turned and said she probably would leave yeah, you with exactly. me for a night and spend the night in a hotel eating what she wants when she wants seeing her girlfriends whatever mm-hmm. you know i mean for yeah. millions of years you know in these hunting and gathering societies they weren't on top of each other day and night i mean men would go hunting for three days women go would mm-hmm. go off weeks uh to another uh, band where their sister lived or or whatever. I mean, this concept of a nuclear family, no other people around to hand the baby to, just him and her, mm-hmm. is really quite artificial. It's amazing we can do it as well as we do. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, so you guys, uh, you got married. You're still madly in love, so you've proven what the science shows. So. Uh, congrats and thanks uh, for the hope for everybody else listening who might have those doubts. Um, but talk about your um, uh, how you've bridged your political differences, because I, that I mean, I feel like that is tearing apart. I mean, not I feel like political differences have torn apart a lot of individuals and, and uh, couples and families. And no question about it. And particularly now, because this pot has been stirred so violently that everybody's mm-hmm. it's more and more you know, uh, us versus them. It's not as Mm -hmm. bad as the Civil War. We're not shooting bullets at each other, at least not yet. Um, So people say it's the worst ever. It's not the worst ever in America, but it's not good. And anyway, so I've always been a Democrat. I I grew up, um, I've just always been a Democrat. Never really thought about it. I just was a Democrat. And uh, politics was never my my basic thing. I've always studied Mm -hmm. love and the mind and personality Mm -hmm. and other things, evolution. But anyway, he is a really ardent um, libertarian, mm-hmm. and a lot of libertarians uh, vote Republican. Mm-hmm. And um, and people have asked me, you know, just like you, uh, mm-hmm. how do I handle this? Yeah. And first of all, I'm a very curious person, and I've learned a lot about mm-hmm. the other mm-hmm. side, and that mm-hmm. is so valuable. I try to keep telling my 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 real democratic friends de- democrat friends about mm-hmm. some of these other ideas that republicans have they won't even listen to me i say you're trying to kill the messenger i'm trying to tell you yeah something about the other side so number one i find it interesting i mm-hmm. do i find it interesting to know both sides of the issue that's interesting to me mm-hmm. the other mm-hmm. thing i've learned is to keep my mouth shut <laughs> there's no point in talking people out of things that they are absolutely dedicated to and instead Mm -hmm. what i do is what they call positive illusions i study the brain there's a whole brain region linked with negativity bias we remember Mm -hmm. the negative for millions of years Mm -hmm. it was adaptive to remember the negative i mean if you know if andrea you and i were around a million years ago and we were great friends great but if we forgot who didn't like us we could die so the bottom line is Brain is built to remember the negative. And what I do at certain times is I I go to my positive illusions. I'll think, well, okay, he thinks that. It's interesting. I don't share that view. But he's mm-hmm. also hilariously funny. Has learned mm-hmm. to dance when we got married. Absolutely mm-hmm. brilliant man. Curls up with me 
before we go to sleep and and listen to to novels to to to, to drift off. Uh, um, uh-huh. He's terribly kind, um, uh-huh. and uh, and he's informative in so many other ways. So yeah. I just move on to these, you know, positive illusions. And by the way, Andrea, it's such a good question because before I met him, I never would have understood it. i have like so many people. How can a Democrat? go out with a Republican. By the way, in right. all of my studies, Republicans are more flexible than Democrats um, ah, and hey. willing to go across the aisle. Yeah. Interesting. More, yeah. Maybe because there's fewer of them. Maybe there's fewer women who are Republicans, so they kind of <laughs> be a little flexible for a while. But whatever. But it's interesting yeah. what, you, what you said, how, you're, how you have seemingly close friends that are way to the left that Way just left. wouldn't listen. I mean, so, I mean, this is, this show is called Open Relationships Transforming Together. Our whole goal is to help people see, um, see, frankly, what's often irrational, right? And I, I feel like I'm going to get a lot of hate mail, right? Because some people will say, but they're so wrong and they don't deserve to be heard. But I don't, I don't think that 40 or 50 percent of our country are idiots, Right. Exactly. And I feel like I feel like we really do ourselves a huge disservice if we it's like um, uh, what is it? Uh, guilt before innocence or, you know, it's like you're you're presumed that they're idiots without really understanding. And you use the word curious, which is one of my favorite words is something I really try to you know do more of in my life to be curious. Um, but just I mean, so. What do you do with those friends? Do you try to kind of break through to them? I mean, are there any instances where you, okay, you give up. Are there any instances where you were able to, you know, get them to to listen or to be more open-hearted or open-minded? Sometimes I'll send them articles uh, that my husband has written. Uh, uh, oh, okay. And so they can do it without me being the messenger. And one mm-hmm. time I got sort of irritated. I said, for God's sake, can't you at least listen to me? Yeah. I mean, you can throw it out. Just listen a bit. And it's very right. interesting. What I've done now in the morning when I do my exercises, I am finally, it took me a while to do this. I turn on CNN for a while and MSNBC, and then I go to Fox. Well, well, totally. But I feel like what I want to come back to is the central point that I want viewers and listeners to take away is why do we feel threatened to hear ideas that we disagree with, right? Because the truth is we we stand to learn, we stand to grow. And if and if we still disagree, to me the most important thing about um learning to do this and learning to become more open is it gives us an exquisite chance to connect with another person in a way that is extremely valuable, right? And I feel like we put up that, you know, to your, to, you know, these friends. And by the way, I've been, I've been that friend before, you know, my, my parents have uh, different political views and I have, and I've been so angry and so judgmental. I mean, stupidly. Interesting. Right? And so it just, it makes me think for people to have the maturity to go, why am I, you know, just check themselves. Why am I threatened by Helen's point of view over, and not even that it's your point of view, the fact that you're trying to explain it. Like, you know, you were talking about maturity a little while ago. It feels profoundly immature to not be willing to at least listen. Right? At, at least listen. At least listen. Well, I do think that there's some things that are very personally threatening. I mean, I think this Roe v. Uh-huh. Wade issue, it was interesting. I did uh-huh. a study last year with Match, and people were much more flexible on their political views than they were on Roe v. Wade. Uh, yeah, a huge percentage of women will not go out with a man who does yeah. not. Well, and yeah, be- I mean, and, and in a way, because the the impact, I mean, it becomes one it's thing on you. political and philosophical. The other is as a practical matter. God bless you if you live in Texas. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I seriously never want to step foot in that state again. Sorry, uh, Jonas. I know <laughs> you're a proud Texan. And, you know, I lived in Houston, but it's maddening. I mean, because like for me, when I think about not only um, are are these women's rights being taken away or have been taken away and so forth and unwanted children and all the all the what I believe is is you know dehumanizing the fact that you can as a provider or even as some like an accomplice okay I'm, I by the way I've I've taken friends to get abortions right I mean oh my god nobody wants that right but if yeah. if that is your only option or if that if that's what you need to do okay not to go on to a big thing with roe v wade um 
But I just think, anyway, I just feel like to to even support somebody who feels like she needs to make that choice for herself, that that's criminalized and that bounties okay. are being taken out. Uh, I just think that is um, that, that is uh, medieval. That's my feeling. Now, when I, I agree with you. I mean, you know, I mean, when you, I mean, when you think of it, uh, presidents do change every four years or eight years. Uh-huh. Having a baby has not changed for the rest of your life. Exactly. Really Thank you, Helen. Affects, you know, and there have been times, not with my husband, but with other people who were very far right, uh, I would just walked out of the room. Yeah. I, 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 it was unbearable to me to see yeah. what I regard as as whatever it is. I mean, I don't want to get canceled yeah. here, but, but the bottom yeah, line is that- I got you. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Um, no, and I, I, you know, I mean, here we're we're here to share opinions and so forth. But it does get to the segment on the show uh, called unpopular opinions, and I have a feeling you have many unpopular opinions because you are uh, radical, uh, like amazingly radical in a lot of ways. Uh, but is there an unpopular opinion too that you want to share? I mean, whether it's around sex or love or dating, or um, you know, biology. I've been thinking about that, you know, I said, uh, I mean, it's unpopular. I know. When I said in the beginning of the show, it's, a, it's probably a very unpopular opinion of mine that relation, good relationships don't take work. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're marinated in psychology, that everything okay. is is uh, blamed on your childhood, on your parents and all that. And, you know, a good 50% of the variation between people has a genetic mm-hmm. base. Yeah. And some people are just plain stubborn. That's who yeah. they are. Mm-hmm. And you don't need to lie on a couch for 15 years to, to try and dissect your entire childhood to figure mm-hmm. out that really is probably as a genetic component. And I well, then and, you should still blame your parents, right? Isn't that where you get your genes? <laughs> 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 no, but this is a, we we do not blame parents on this show. We're willing yeah. to reflect, but I I'm I'm with you, right? That we I mean yes we we learn a lot from our parents and and caregivers and sometimes it's aunties and uncles and siblings but I, I I'm with you and I think it gets back to the maturity thing it's like okay let me reflect but then let me have some agency in my life and not say I'm going to be forever stuck because of what happened right. or what didn't happen yeah right? you know, that's, well, well people are terrified that when I talk about genetics which I do all the time that it's going to determine yeah. behavior it's not going to these are predispositions People can be predisposed yeah. to alcoholism and they give up drinking. Mm-hmm. You know, they can yeah. be predisposed to eating too much and they slim down. And But the bottom line yeah. is we do Well, have there's free will, to... right? And my book on gender difference in the brain was extremely unpopular in a certain group of people. And you know what I was trying to say in that book? I was trying to say, look, not only are men and women on average, on average, uh, have some different skills, but because women are piling into the job market, they're bringing a whole pile of skills that the world can use. Yeah. I mean, they tend to be more verbally skilled. They tend to be more empathetic. They learn all languages faster. They see way down the road. Uh, they'd probably be very good at negotiating. I mean, if you can divide a cupcake, one cupcake between five <laughs> and three-year-olds, you can probably yeah. do pretty well in the world. But yeah. I sure enough, a whole lot of people who are so dedicated to thinking that men and women are exactly alike, that they bombed the book. Yeah. Five years writing that book, and the opinion was so unpopular. Helen, that when, did, were... when when was that? I because I mean I feel like the world has has changed in in a lot of ways. Not for the better. No. Because I'm I I would just be curious that at one point if you tried to or not tried, but if you brought it back, I've got to believe there is a in, informed group of people that will say, you know what, let's look, let's not be afraid of the data. Right. Let's right. not be afraid of the data. Let's I mean, because it. that's you're a scientist. Right. Well, you know, I recently wrote a piece and somebody wrote back and said, well, what about social constructionism? You know, that everything is socially constructed. And I had to go into yet again a million different ways of saying that, look, for example, here's an example. I think I've told you this before, Andrea. You know, there is a gene in the serotonin system linked mm-hmm. with religiosity, also called uh, yeah. self trans transcendent self-transcendent yeah the ability to get out of yourself enough to really believe there's something out there yeah um religiosity is the term academic term there's a gene in the serotonin system so here's an example you grow up in the united states and you acquire that gene and your family is religious you're going to be a christian or a jew largely mm-hmm. jewish or christian if you grow up in um iran you're going to be muslim 
So yeah. the gene, the predisposition for the religiosity is there. And mm -hmm. then in different cultures, um, people uh, uh, take on different religions with different belief systems because of their culture. You know, yeah. as uh, Steven Pinker once said, he said, it's 100% biology and it's 100% culture. I love that. Culture yeah. plays a role, but biology yeah. plays a role too. Yeah. And I do think that of all my unpopular ideas, that's the most unpopular that I am mm -hmm. trying to talk about the second half of the puzzle. People mm -hmm. will immediately say, oh, well, you know, it's all genetic. She's saying it's all genetic. They are not listening. Yeah. They're so scared that maybe this is going to determine behavior, that they don't have free will. None of mm -hmm. us are saying that. We're basically mm -hmm. saying, look, there's two basic parts of who you are. There's everything you mm -hmm. came into this world with, and there's, and there's then how the world sculpts that brain. Mm -hmm. Like you, my children, Andrea, are they mm -hmm. alike? No. Oh my God. They're both, they're both, um, you know, uh, I was going to uh, say something else, but uh, you know, like great kind of crazy kids, but they are, um, yeah, but they, you know, similar in a lot of ways, but super different. I mean, Jonas met them. Well, Brian's met them recently too. It's like similar in that they're very loud, <laughs> very rambunctious, uh, you know, 10 and 13 year old, but one is way wonkier and, and more curious in science. And the other is like all sports all day long. Right. So, yeah, I mean, and it's like same parents, you know, and I think, I mean, birth order. Do you, what do you believe in birth order? Is that something it's that you think is, is real? Because I've read those books on birth order and it makes uh -huh. a lot of sense. But actually, then I did my own study on it and, and really actually didn't find um, that it uh, played out. But um, okay. you would certainly think, I mean, you would certainly would think, I mean, in families, people do take different roles. Right. Um, yeah. Based on who's who's first and who's second and who's getting and, attention and all that. That's the experience and who doesn't know what they're doing because they're three years old and they've got a 18 year old brother. <laughs> right. <laughs> or whatever. So I would certainly yeah. think that I mean, there there is a lot of a lot of people who study this and yeah. they do find that there is uh, something to it. There's something mm -hmm. to everything. There's all kinds of forces in 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 the culture that are going to steer you in certain directions. But can you change? Can you make a, a really um, shy, um, detail-oriented mathematician into a firebrand, mergers and acquisitions guy? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Can you make Helen Fisher into uh, Albert Einstein? No. Oh, I was going to say, can we make Helen Fisher into a shrinking uh, violet? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> the radiant <laughs> Helen Fisher does not shrink. Um, okay, so the other question I want to get to, and I want to be mindful of of our time. Um, we're we're getting toward the end here with you, unfortunately. Um, I shared this concept that I've been developing called uninvited Buddhas, um, and to remind our audience, these are the people in our lives that um, oh, can cause us no degree of despair. Could be like your friends that aren't listening, right? Uh, so often, I've found in my life, my uninvited Buddhas sometimes are my kids, sometimes it's my husband. Um, these people that oh, you just it's like they're just a pain in the neck. Could they just be more like us or could they just go away? God damn it. Um, often they have, I mean, always, if we let them, they have something profoundly important to help us see about ourselves. And so I am like all about the uninvited Buddha because I've had a, a, a number of these people help me transform and become, you know, sort of that mature best version of myself. Helen, any, any of these to share? I think that, um, I have one friend who's extremely religious Mm -hmm. extremely Christian. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why she can't be more sympathetic to um, Muslims and Jewish people mm -hmm. and Buddhists. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. don't get it. I just don't get it. And I think what she's what I'm learning here is that people pick ways to have some control uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, in life. And uh, recently I had a very uh, scary medical issue. Uh -huh. And as they say, there's no atheist in a foxhole. <laughs> right. And after over 70 years of not believing in anything, uh -huh. I found a little religion of my own. Ooh. It was really crazy. 
Uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. It happened to be a, a bird, a cardinal bird. And every single time I had a real problem, um, this cardinal would show up. Oh, wow. I know perfectly well the cardinal is not that what I'm doing is I'm what I'm doing is giving myself the privilege of some control. Yeah. And uh and meaning, right? That there's something meaning. some control and some meaning and significance to this, right? And it helped me with that uninvited Buddha. That this person Ooh. I get it now of why she needs that. I, I uh-huh. was intellectually got it, uh-huh. but I didn't get it um, profoundly emotionally, and na- and and now I do. So I wanted to ask about that earlier because we were talking about, you know, people with uh, political differences, um, and uh, the how how is it like how is it possible or or what advice do you have when like to see each other as human when. Like, for example, we were talking about the Roe v. Wade stuff. Like, if you're trying to talk to or reason with somebody who, you know, supports that and you feel like what they're doing is enabling people who inherently hurt you or control you or like how how is it possible to to kind of bridge the gap and still talk to someone without immediately feeling like, you know, anger or dismissive towards somebody you think is like, I hate to say it like this, but like out to get you, you know, or support people that does. I haven't conquered that. Roe v. Wade is something that I (laughs) would lie down in front of a tank to give to women. I am not able to agree. So the only thing I can do, and of course, I want to argue with them. Yeah, I want to say, you're measuring a tiny thing, little seed, the size of a piece of rice, compared to a woman whose whole life is ahead of her, and then they'll Mm -hmm. say, oh, they can take a bus to another another state. I didn't have that kind of money when I was a teenager to take a bus to another state Mm -hmm. and bring a girlfriend because I'd be too scared or find a hotel. I, I, it's to me, it's now I'll probably get canceled for saying it, but I, uh, it is the one topic that I cannot. Non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. Helen Fisher, I'm with you, baby. Um, (laughs) Hey, I want to come back to Cardinals because I just looked up, I did a little research. Um, (laughs) Uh, because I was just curious. You said you found this as a symbol. I don't know if you know this, Helen. Cardinals represent devotion, loving relationships, courtship, and monogamy Monogamy above everything else in the Native American lore. Uh-oh. Isn't that amazing? How cool is that? So, yeah, you, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It sounds a little woo-woo for Helen Fisher, but it maybe, maybe there's something to be said about the, maybe woo-woo. those cardinals are real. It's woo-woo, and I'm sticking with it. You're sticking with it. I love There's it. There's no such thing as coincidence. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. So, Helen, the um, uh, other question I wanted to, you know, uh, ask you, you are this icon, right? You are one of the most successful, amazing people I know. Um, but even as you described, I mean, you, you've got your, your vulnerabilities from time to time. Who do you turn to when you're feeling, you know, angry or heartbroken or doubtful? Um, do you have a... You know, is it John? Is it a group of girlfriends? Does it just uh, depend um, on the it's situation? John. Your sister? It's John. John knows. We've got, I mean, I've got John. an identical twin sister who I could always turn to. Um, but she lives in France, and I certainly do talk to her all the time, and we are very, very close friends. But there's business issues that John knows all about. Yeah. It, I mean, if it's a health issue, she mm-hmm. would be just as good. Yeah. And I've got close friends. I'd even turn to you, Andrea, but... Uh, but you know, I, 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 John is number one. He's number John one. Is- I love that, John. We love you. We want you on the show next time, buddy. Oh, he's good. He's oh, good. I know he's good. I've met him. He's like brainiac guy. Yeah, can we get both of you on together? I think that's yeah. Well, that would be interesting. You know, when we got married, um, the Today Show wanted us on because it was so astonishing to them that a seventy-five-year-old woman would be getting married at all, particularly to a glorious man. You know, and so they put us on together, and. Um, Oh, whatever. Oh, we might have to find that clip, uh, Brian, to give a little, you know, put that little uh, the thumbnail and maybe some of the highlights. I don't think I saw that. I want to find it. That's so cool. It was charming. Absolutely charming. You were the New coolest, York Helen. I guess because, you know, A, I, I'm known for studying love and and B, I'm 
an old girl marrying a younger man. I, I, I'm sorry he's younger, to be honest with you, but uh, um, because you're a hot scientist who's married a, uh, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> You guys are wonderful. Uh, wonderful. A, a hot, a hot journalist from the New York Times. Um, that's amazing. Okay, I think we're getting to time. Helen, is there anything that we haven't asked you about that we um, should have asked you about, or you know, last uh, kind of last thoughts for you, for us, and our audience on open relationships? Well, I think one thing I'd like to to say is how why I am so positive about the future. Oh, yes. That's a great note to end on. Um, And I have there's three worldwide trends that are really important. And they all uh, appear to be bringing us towards a few decades of relative family stability. And here they are. Number one is something that I have coined called slow love. And in all of my studies, as it turns out, I mean, in my day, people married at age 21 uh, or 22. Today, they're marrying at age 29. 30, mm-hmm. 31, et cetera. So we have this long period uh, in your 20s of what I call the pre-commitment stage of mm-hmm. courtship. Mm-hmm. And all of my data on 80 cultures through the demographic yearbooks of the United Nations from 1947 to 2011, I collected data. Every society, the longer you, well, no, not, there's some that are still married very young in the rural areas of, of whatever. But anyway, the bottom line is around the world, the, the longer you court and yeah. the later you marry, the more likely you are to remain together. And that's exactly mm-hmm. what's happening in America and around the world today. They are marrying later. That's number okay. one. Number two, in America, uh, more people are meeting somebody on the Internet than oh. off the Internet. Not just match, but anywhere mm-hmm. on the Internet. And an article came from the University of Chicago that said that if you met they studied married people and they studied, you know, they said they found that if you met somebody on the internet as opposed to off the internet, you were um, um, uh, less likely to divorce. And I thought to myself, oh, that's a little why, surprising. What difference does it make if you meet in a hotel yeah. lobby or in an airport or in a bar or on mm-hmm. the street, whatever? Why would it make any difference? So I did my own study of 5,000 people. And as it turns out, people who meet or date, on the internet, introduce on the internet mm-hmm. as opposed to off the internet, are more likely to be fully employed, more likely mm-hmm. to be um, higher educated, and more likely mm-hmm. to be interested in a committed relationship. So, number one, slow mm-hmm. love, we're marrying later. Number two, we're meeting on the internet. And number three, what we've talked about, women are piling into the job market in cultures around the world. They don't have to marry when they're very young. They can leave partnerships that are absolutely yeah. terrible in order to make better ones they're more interesting than they have been in ten thousand years and they're making very interesting partnerships now uh mm-hmm. with the double income family so those three basic trends marry later meeting on the internet and women piloting the job market all point to the fact that we could be moving forward to a time of relative family stability which would be great yeah, I mean, amen. At a time when uh, we are in a, I mean, the Surgeon General has claimed that the that there's a loneliness epidemic, right? I know you know that. And gosh, when I look at all the all the signals from um, high uh, rates of anxiety, depression, suicide, addiction, um, so many of these different metrics, this bit of hope toward family stability uh, is is It'd welcome. Be great. So thanks for yeah, that. Yeah, would be great. And and I, I I do hope we I mean you know the young used to be dying of murder now they're dying of suicide they're turning yeah. inward it's really that's the one thing I I actually got an award from my boarding school a couple of weeks ago and oh. I was supposed to give five minutes it was very charming I was terrible in boarding school really got suspended I just didn't follow the rules it was amazing you're the bad girl oh Helen Fisher was the bad girl oh we've been talking about bad boys we are very sexist here on open relationships we're gonna do better next time people. Well, the bottom line is that uh, I had to give some advice, and I didn't give this piece of advice, but I, I felt like saying, if you just do me one favor, just don't kill yourself. Oh, God. There's Oof, more out there. Just yeah. don't. Well, I don't care yeah, just, if you wear yeah. different colored socks. I don't care if you smoke pot. I don't care about your math exam. I don't yeah. want you to kill yourself. We poured a lot of time and money into you. Yeah. <laughs> We're expecting you to be our future. 
But not yeah. just that. Just it's not worth it. Just don't do that. Just don't do that. Anyway, well, so we should, yeah, when we have you back on, this is, I mean, obviously it's such a uh, such a terrible epidemic. I mean, Jonas and I have shared stories of profound heartache in losing people by um, suicide close to us. Okay. And, so um, you know, Brian, I'm not sure about you, but I just, you know, when you um, when you just realize that that they just feel like there's so much desperation and there's no way out. It's like, how do we how do we I mean, uh, we were having a discussion earlier that what's going on is systemic. I mean, there's this, you know, super high rate of depression and, you know, issues with kids and, you know, over medication and are over medicalizing things. Um, and it's like, what's happening systemically? I mean, something is happening systemically. And I've, I certainly have my views. I know you do. And there's, you know, there's some data out there, but it's... Um, it's yeah, it's it's hard. Uh, but congratulations on your award, even though you're a bad girl at your where where did you go to boarding school? <laughs> oh, shipping school in Brimar. No, nobody would have would have thought Ellen Fisher was ever going to make anything out of herself. I got up and that's the first <laughs> thing I said. I'm telling you, <laughs> that's I mean. cool. That's cool, right? Those people that are like, what do we, you know, like we're, you know, we have doubts about ourselves. There's and hope so for forth. you. <laughs> there is hope for you. There is hope for you. That is amazing. All right, uh, folks, that's our show. Uh, Helen Fisher, you are the best. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us so much time today. We're excited to have you back uh, with or without John. Um, Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Gosh, wow, guys. How amazing is she? She's a miracle. Yeah. Yeah, no, her her insights and I just I it's like hopeless romantic. Uh, what do you say? Uh, like just you know this. I don't want to say crazy scientist because she's not crazy, but like unbelievable scientist with um you know big, my as my ten uh, year old would say, big brained and big hearted. Um, <laughs> uh, Brian, what was your favorite takeaway or what was the thing that you learned today that um you're gonna probably uh, chew on and you know uh, talk to Sarah about uh, later tonight? Well, I mean, there was a lot of fun stuff. I mean, I want to actually uh, validate Sarah and her friends. I want to go back and mm -hmm. be like, a biological anthropologist like uh, agrees know, with you interviews. about sexual interviews. Yes. Keep doing them, except Sarah, not you, because you're engaged. No, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Jonas, what about you? God, there's so much. I mean, it's I such a, a mountain or an onion, if you will. It's a mountain uh -huh. you climb perpetually and an onion and you, onion you constantly peel. unpeel and open and they're different layers. I think, you know, the scientific basis obviously is fascinating and profound. And I love her mm -hmm. infinite curiosity. And I think mm -hmm. we all share that on some level. That's why we're mm -hmm. voyeuristic and we're curious and mm -hmm. so much of our content on your tango and what re it revolves around love and intertwines around relationships. I think the the evolutionary aspect of this as a driving force to try to understand love and our, our impulses as humans, as human animals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also that love itself, uh, Brian and Andrea, is an evolution of us as humans, as individuals, yeah. as couples, as communities, and so forth. And that's fascinating. Uh, so acknowledging that, I think, in a way, is a virtue, right? Mm -hmm. It's to hold that. It's a sacred fire. And you can learn yeah. so much about yourself through the lens of love. And so to me, I think that's the imprinting and really brought to mind a number of questions from the idea of slow love, which is definitely something I can relate to in my relationship with Laura, you know, and, mm -hmm. and our, us developing as a couple. Mm -hmm. um, but so many other layers from sexual attraction to romance to attachment, all of those mm -hmm. things hit me at the head and the heart yeah. uh, in, in a very powerful way. I mean, what a what a gift to oh, humanity. Yeah, so good. And, and I, I like her point about the addiction to love, uh, Brian. Um, yes. You might need to cue a little, is it Robert Plant or Robert Palmer? Remember? Ga -na 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 -na. I'm addicted Palmer. to love. I'm addicted okay, to love. Palmer. All right. You guys yeah. want me to keep singing? Um, <laughs> I don't know the words. <laughs> well, <Okay>. and uh, <laughs> just like in general, I mean, more about uh, Dr. Helen Fisher, but like, holy crap, is she able to, to balance like, the science and understanding of everything right. like without being a robot about it yeah. by like being compassionate and like yeah. understanding like 
that you know emotions are science you know what i mean if that makes yeah. sense so like mm -hmm. the the delicate balance between the two like she's amazing i can't wait well, to have she's her back so, uh, yeah i mean it's amazing to have a scientist i mean this is like me being stereotypical but somebody who's such a you know unbelievably accomplished science scientist who's so passionate right it's cool that that you know, she is the foremost um, expert and, you know, the person quoted most on love. The thing I really want to emphasize, um, how important laughter is in relationships, right? And fun. And she talks about uh, dopamine. And, you know, we didn't talk about it today, but she's done a lot of research. We've talked about it in other shows about how important um, novel, you know, having novel experiences in our relationships to keep our relationships exciting and, you know, to continue to... Um, uh, have that dopamine um, um, excreted into your um, brain and, you know, as I understand, into your stomach because neurotransmitters are often made in the gut. But just I think about one of my dear friends. Um, he's passed away, my dear friend Andrew, one of the funniest guys in the world. And I just, you know, I think about he was the youngest of, I think, four brothers and how adaptive um, humor is, right? And I would say, I mean, I, I adore the guy. He's not your you know, Cary Grant, tall, dark, and handsome. He was a little short and round, but, you know, he was the guy that we all loved and adored. He was the funniest guy in the room. And I, I think this idea of how attractive humor is, you know, for, you know, in attraction and then in our relationships, how important laughter, you know, I feel like we've talked about this before, how we, how so many of us think of fun as a nice to have, but fun is really a need to have. So I'm going to I'm going to work a little harder on fun in in my family and core relationships. I uh, nobody wants me to try to be funny. <laughs> but I'm going to keep trying. So uh so yay for yay for more laughter in relationships. Yeah, I mean look, it's, she's right. I think the the exercise piece is, you know, I think she hinted mm -hmm. at the I, mm -hmm. the idea of the long walk on the high line with John that she mentioned. Oh yeah. The you know, there's obviously the sex piece, the romance piece, which is huge too. But you're right, laughter, laughter is at the yeah, essence. Nobody's gonna argue it. No, I mean, if we want controversy on the show, nobody's gonna argue that. La you know, more laughter is better. So yeah, no, let let's go long laughter. Um, okay. Oh, hey, thank you. I love it. All right. Um, I think that's really it for our show. Um, I want to keep talking to you guys, but I realize we've got. Um, all good things come to an end, but there are going to be more shows. So uh, <laughs> that's it for today, folks. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Open Relationships. We love our audience. We're so grateful to, to do this show. Please like us, follow us, subscribe to our show wherever you watch videos or get podcasts. Please write to us. Tell us what you love. Tell us what you don't love. Um, tell us uh, what you want us to cover on openrelationships at yourtango.com. That's our email address. As I've said before, I am doing free relationship coaching on air. So if you are willing to let me talk with you about a relationship issue and um, uh, let our list, our audience listen in, uh, please let us know because we realize how many of these issues in, in people's lives are common and uh, we are here to help. Um, Brian, I always forget whatever else I'm supposed to say. This is your Tango production. Anything else I missed? Uh, no, I mean, you you nailed uh, pretty I'm much all of it. If you better if time. you. <laughs> And if you just want to uh, quickly find our podcast on the YouTube page, there is a tab for podcasts and you can find the Open Relationships podcast right there. And that's it. That's Thank you, it. everybody. That's our show. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Mwah.